Ephesians is called, just a reminder, the queen of the epistles. Of all the epistles that Paul wrote, this is deemed to be the most contemporary. That is to say, you can understand it as you read it. It looks kind of modern. Many other letters that he wrote includes portions and sections that you go, huh? You need to do a little bit of cultural digging around. This is not like that. This is more plain and simple. Are you glad about that? Okay, for the plain and simple like me, this works, all right. But it wasn't why we picked it. We picked it because we wanted to relay foundations of relationship, church relationships, because historically, the church doesn't do relationships very well, which is incredibly sad because out there without Jesus, you kind of get it, right? But with the Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit and clear instruction in the Word of God, still, after hundreds and thousands of years, actually, still, many people don't understand God's parameters for healthy human church relationships. And so we are deliberately going into this letter even more. Alrighty, so just a, a little reminder that the whole letter is about Jesus and through Christ, He brings people from many nations together and he wants them to relate together. And he tells us in the, sec the second half of the book, so the first three chapters is really about doctrine. It's really the theology of relationship. It's about what all that Christ did. And then the second half, the 50%, the three chapters, four, five, and six, is about what does that look like practically? And so that's where we're in this practical session. How do we live with each other? If we can't just unfriend each other, if we can't just ignore each other, what, what are we supposed to actually do to get on and multiculturally and multi-generationally do it in a way that's rewarding and healthy and reflective of God's kingdom to this lost world? The interesting thing about this is our deepest need, I, I propose to you, is to have meaningful, rewarding relationship. And our deepest hurts can be from the very same people. And I love this quote from a person who I have no idea where they came from. I don't even know them from a bar or soap, but I agree with what they said. They said, every relationship needs an argument every now and then, just to prove that it is strong enough to survive. Long-term relationships, the one that really matter, are all about weathering the peaks and the valleys. I agree with that. The wonder and the reward of relationships, but also the complexity. So let's get to our text today. And we're in chapter five of the book of Ephesians, if you haven't picked it up yet so far. And we're going to start at verse eight. And I want to use the ESV version today. So I'm going to um, request that you stand to your feet once again for in honor of the word of God. Verses eight through 14. For at one time you were darkness. But now you are in the Lord, the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, says the Apostle Paul, therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Please take your seat. I want to call this sermon, this talk, the reality of spiritual family. The reality of spiritual family. I wonder if you, like me, from time to time, you have conversations with people, maybe you haven't seen them for a little while, and you say, 
Hey, how you doing? Anybody heard that before? How you doing? And, and, and they go, oh, I wonder if you've heard this. They go, oh, oh I'm, 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 I'm on a journey. Has anybody heard about the, the journey? Yeah, in our house, we're almost over it. We call it the road trip. I'm on a journey. Now, to be clear, life is a bit of a journey and, and life isn't just a straight line. It's not linear, right? It's like the weather in Auckland. There are changes, unpredictable changes. There are environments, there are circumstances and <laughs> human responses, including our own. In that sense, following Jesus is like being on a journey. But listen to me clearly. If on a journey is code for people can't tell that I'm even a Christian, there's a major problem of biblical proportions. Sometimes I think that oh, I'm on a journey <laughs> is really code for I'm deeply involved in constant sin and I, no one can really tell I'm even a Christian, but I know I come to church. Is anybody with me? So Paul is speaking to those people on the journey, that kind of, of journey. And Paul is saying that a Christian, everybody say Christian. I'm gonna give you some good theology today, good Bible teaching today. Paul is saying undoubtedly that a Christian has undergone a profound change. They were darkness. It doesn't say in the text they were in darkness. They themselves were darkness, but now they are light in the Lord. The Christian is essentially different from when they were not a Christian. And there should be no difficulty in telling if they are a Christian or not. It's the difference between darkness and light. Now, Paul is saying a second thing here. He's saying that this change, this transformation, it's not superficial. It's, it's actually very deep. The unbeliever is, is not only in darkness, as I mentioned, they are darkness. I was darkness. My heart was dark. It wasn't just an environmental thing that I was around. It's in a re unregenerated heart of an unbeliever. And likewise, a Christian is not a person that has received a little bit of light. They are light in the Lord. The light of God, which stands for His holiness, His majesty, His wisdom, His power. When you get become a Christian and you are regenerated, the light of the Lord is residing inside of you. There is such a difference. It should be a discernible difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. Can somebody say amen to that? There is light in the very center of your being and your constitution as a person, a Christian. That's, the contrast is stark. It's, it's, they are mutually exclusive. And I get worried in this progressive on a journey culture that we live in that actually you can't tell much difference between a Christian and a non-Christian, at least in the church in Ephesus. Do you see how relevant it is for us today? And it's interesting. The Lord has chosen to use light and darkness as an analogy to show the complete separation of the non-Christian and the Christian, the child of Satan and the child of God. There's only two religions in the world. Did you know that? It's in the Bible, it says there's true religion and there's false religion. When it comes to salvation, there's no gray. This room is filled with people who are either saved or not saved, either Christian or not Christian. One is darkness. The text is very clear about that. It's about what's in side of us. Have you noticed how most sin happens in the darkness? Just walk into a nightclub and turn the lights on. <laughs> Everyone just, ah! 
or the little devil's flying around, hands are moving everywhere, clothes are going back on. It's true. Last night, there's a lot of sin going down around here. Wait for the darkness. Hopefully no one can see. In contrast, what Paul says is of one of the more difficult statements within Scripture. It says, but now you are light in the Lord. We cannot be light in ourselves. We are, if we are in Him, who is light, we too are light. Is anybody getting this? The contrast is actually extreme to show the difference and the distinction and the opposite nature of Christians and non-Christians. Now, to be sure, the apostles constantly use this analogy of light, and I just want to do a quick little survey for you so you know that I'm not lying today. To the church of Corinth, Paul says, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go over to the church in Colossae, the book of Colossians, giving thanks to the Father who has glorified us to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in the light. Another one for good measure for Thessalonica. Let's go there. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons, daughters of light and sons and daughters of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And let's throw in Peter. That famous scripture in 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may, may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Do you see it? From the creation and genesis of light through to this very day, Light is a theme throughout Scripture weaving its way to say that there is a distinct difference between darkness and light, and there should be a distinct difference. It is, in fact, a distinct difference between someone who's truly been born again and someone who has not been born again. Now, I remember as a young person for many, many years, like many of you, I've gone to church. I know what it's like to hang around light, but not be light in the Lord. I knew something was missing. I was involved in church life, but I knew I wasn't born again. I was even serving on a worship team, and, but I wasn't born again. Where the light of the Lord was shining inside, I, I, I sort of was hanging out in the, the overflow of light around other people and church culture, but I wasn't a person who was born again. I'd tell people if they really wanted to know, I'd sort of indicate, depending on how the audience was, that maybe I was a Christian or maybe I even was, but actually I didn't live like that. It's called hypocrisy. Until March 19. 93, when I gloriously was translated from the kingdom of darkness, ladies and gentlemen, to the kingdom of light. I wonder, has anybody received one of these? I have. There's a thing going on right now about these text message scams. Has anybody received one of these? Some of them from the New Zealand Transport Association. I've been getting one from NZ Post. Seriously, like you've got a parcel needs to be picked up. Click here, right? They look real. They look legitimate, okay? I mean, it appears to be that IRD are promising a tax refund or there's an outstanding fine you have to pay. My goodness me, in fact, believe it or not, it says here, Cert New Zealand, the government cybersecurity agency revealed earlier this year that Kiwis lost over 3.7 million, the article's there, million in online scams in just the first quarter of 2022 alone. Here's the thing about a scam. 
They look legitimate, but they are not. They're really good at making you feel like it's real, but it's fake. It's a counterfeit. Beneath the surface is a wicked plan to be to deceive you. And the writer of Ephesians is saying that there is a dangerous scam that is lurking around the fringes of Christianity and it's deceiving many people. Now listen to me and listen to me clear, please. Paul is concerned not only about the Christian and the person who's obviously, blatantly and, and, and openly not a Christian. But guess what? He's not talking to them. They wouldn't be in the church in Ephesus. They wouldn't be caught within a thousand miles of church. They're blatantly, obviously, and openly not a Christian. What Paul is trying to show, he's trying to show the difference between a Christian who is in the light of the Lord and the so-called moral person who is in church, but they're not a Christian. He's trying to distinguish the difference of churchgoers who genuinely are Christians who live in the light of the Lord and moral people and people who think that they can be okay with God, religious only people. And I think that's what God wants to say to us today. How can you tell? the difference between a Christian and a religious only person. You look at their fruit. Fruit reveals the root. Verse nine says, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Spiritual goodness, spiritual rightness, spiritual truth under attack and most Christians are totally oblivious to the scam the fruit of darkness to be clear was mentioned in the previous section that Shandy in fact the former verse all of chapter 8 talks about the the fruits of darkness and and here's if you just look across the, the scriptures right there you'll find that the fruit of darkness is across the whole of the personality It shows itself in the mind. It shows itself in the will. It shows itself in the heart in a kind of dullness, foolishness, slothfulness, a lethargy and a deadness that Paul talked about in the previous sections. These are works of darkness and they're unfruitful and it actually says they're shameful. Then we come, praise Jesus, to the other side. To people who used to be all that, used to be in the dark, but now no longer are they that. They are now light in the Lord and they walk as children of the light. And then the fruit of the light will naturally grow from being born again, from a new birth, from being regenerated by the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? All that is good and right and true. Can I tell you something today, dear Church Fano? Don't try to keep manufacturing the fruit, just attend to your root. Paul argues If you have a genuine root in Christ, then the fruit will take care of itself. There should be no real reason, he says, to press for behavioral change upon Christians because they understand who they are and what they are. If we are truly born again, if we're truly born of the Spirit of God, Get this, as 1 Peter would say, if we're truly partakers of his divine nature, then we don't want to just go on and behave in a certain way. We should never do anything in the Christian life merely for the sake of doing it. We 
What we need to do, my friends, is look at the root system of our life. Look at where our foundations lie. Paul is saying when the root is correct, it's not so hard. When you truly are grateful and truly have been born again of the Spirit, and all this religious human works is vanished away, and we realize it's only through Christ and His finished work that we can experience the supernatural, radical transformation in our heart and we become a new person. We're rewired and redesired. We are new people. It's called being born again. And Paul realized there were many in the church of Ephesus that thought they were Christians, but they were not. They were religious and they attended a church when they felt like it. And Paul, because of his love for the people, because of his understanding of eternity, because of his understanding of the spiritual realm in which we live, he brought it to their attention. Truth and love come together to see the Spirit of God awaken people to the truth. But pastor... The sermon is called The Reality of Spiritual Family. What does light and darkness have to do with spiritual family? Well, the bond of spiritual family is as the name suggests, spirit. And this is the essential difference between us and a club. This is not a club. This is a church. And what binds us together, what bonds us together, it should be so in any church, is the Holy Spirit. There should always be, in my opinion, in a healthy church, people who are not of that spirit, who are visiting and coming around like honey, like bees around honey. There's life and there's spirit and there's something there that's drawing. That's healthy. In my view, that's very healthy. We don't want to be exclusive. But those who call themselves a part of the local church becoming a, or a part of a church, they ought to know their placement. And too many have dumbed down the gospel to a feel-good little message and people don't know if they're even saved or not. And Paul cuts you all the PC crap. And he says, you're either a Christian or you're not. How does this relate to spiritual family? Because our individual spiritual health impacts the family. Christianity has never been an individual religion on its own. Chapter 4, verse 25 of the very same letter says, We are members of one another. Remember that story about the foot, the mouth, the head, the hand? We are members of one another. And that's why I'm calling it spiritual family today because the degree of that, what spirit are we drawing from? What spirit are we making our decisions from? What truth are we going for? Are we more concerned about gossip and social media or what the Scripture says about how to do family? Like if we're Christians, we should be looking to see what Christ's followers did, what Jesus said, right? Would that be logical? And so what He says is more important to me than even my own family. Chrissy, would you join me, please? Maybe the whole band could come and join me. Please. How can I change, Pastor? How can I change? I hear what you're saying and I even feel my heart beating, the Holy Spirit bringing conviction. How can I change? Can I say this? You can't. I can't. I remember the story of, it's called The Failure of a Good Pig. It's a story about a person who, let's not show that slide now. If you could just go back, please, and hold that. I just want you to pause because I want to tell the story. 
the failure of a good pig. You can have a pig and you can invite that little piggy to live inside of your house and you can give it a full on shower. You can even blow dry the bristles and give a little manicure to the trotters. You can invite that little pig to eat your dinner just beside you, bottom on the chair, trotters on the table, smelling good. Throw a little bit of cologne in there as well. And you can then watch a beautiful movie after dinner called Babe. Sit there with a blanket and just have that lovely bow around the neck. And you can do all of that, ladies and gentlemen. But can I tell you today that as soon as that door opens, that pig is going to bolt for the mud pit because it's part of his very nature. And it's exactly the same for you and I today. It's exactly the same. It's the nature that needs to change. The pig will automatically, it, has to, it just can't help itself. You can try and keep it clean, but as soon as it can get free from the control of the owner, it will be out in the dirt and the mud and it will wallow around and it will have a great time because it's in its nature. And just like you and I, we were born, our human nature, our Adamic nature, automatically leans towards sin. And we need in order to receive a new nature, it's not through behavioral modification, ladies and gentlemen, it's about surrender. It's about receiving the nature of Christ, being partakers of His divine nature. And that's why religion only does not work. In fact, it's worse. I wanna suggest to you the great enemy of the church is not those who are blatantly, obviously and openly opposed to the church. It's those who are in the church who think they are Christians. It's called false advertising to the world. By nature we sin. And it's people who through faith and belief in Christ, who through trusting in Him, they can receive a new nature and they undergo and that which I have also undergone. A beautiful spiritual transformation. What a joy. When your heart changes, your desires change, your appetites change, your view of people changes, your view of the world, your understanding of what's happening changes. You become compassionate. You become caring. You become generous. God changes people. It's always been about a heart change, a change of nature. I wonder, do you feel like that pig? Let's just be honest. When we're on our own, we're doing our thing. Are we running to sin? The Bible commands us, Christian, to walk as children of light and to have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. It commands us in recent sections to walk in love, to stop sexual sin and unclean speech, to walk in holiness and walk in true righteousness. Oh, pastor, honestly, I can't do it. And I want to say to you, I believe you. Oh, pastor, I look at those commands that Paul says and they just seem impossible to which I want to say you're absolutely correct. They are impossible. And that is the point. To stop relying on your own strength. Oh, what you need is power. What you need is a flow. What you need, ladies and gentlemen, is a cleansing strength of the Spirit of God that will generate something fresh on the inside to be able to say no to addiction, to be able to say no to previous lifestyles, to say yes to holiness and cleanliness. It is the God, it is God the Spirit who changes. It's God the Spirit who cleanses and rewires and redesires your heart. Oh, pastor, how do I receive the Spirit? Oh, pastor, how do I receive 
this new nature. I'm glad you asked. It's right there in verse 14. It says, Therefore, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul has gone back to the Old Testament. He's put some thoughts together from Isaiah and a bit from Psalm. He's put together a compilation that is essentially a summation of the gospel. (laughs) The same gospel that will save you is the same gospel that will sanctify you. Oh, 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 I'm getting excited now, but I can't jump. Otherwise, I'll lose my microphone. It's the grace of God that will illuminate your understanding of your need of Him. It is the grace of God that offers the power of the Holy Spirit to create a new birth, to be born again. It's the grace of God that will justify you. It's the grace of God that will sanctify you, ladies and gentlemen. It is the grace of God that makes available the power of the Spirit to continually renew and refill and to keep pouring power into your life. To walk as children of light. You see, verse 14's got a double meaning. It's a a nod to Calvary. It tells us a problem and it tells us a solution. It, It tells us that we are, many of us here, are spiritually asleep. Let me be honest to the text. The text says that some of us here are dead, spiritually dead. That's the problem. And that's why your behavioral modification, you're constantly circling back out to the mud pit, keeps happening because you're dead spiritually. But in this very same verse, we find the solution. See, Christ died for us, for which we, I hope, are eternally grateful. But here's what He's modeling for us. In order to experience new life, you have to die. To you can't have a resurrection until there's a death. He went before us. He, he was sinless, but He died, showing us that the way to healing, the way to victory, the way to breakthrough, the way to maturity, the way to living in a flourishing kind of a life, instead of circling around like a stinking pig, is to die to yourself. Die to your selfish will. Die to your sin. Die to your pride. It's intense in the room, isn't it? That's the exact tone of this letter. It's intense. It's not soft, lovely, Paul, meek and mild. He said, there's a heaven and there's a hell. If you're a Christian, act like it, but you don't rely on your own strength. You've got a root structure to the power of the Holy Spirit, which is access through prayer, access through confession and repentance and worship and the scriptures and fellowship the renewal and the refilling and the strengthening and the awakening of the Spirit of God. It's time. It's time. Behold, I want to invite you today to die. Is that not the Christian message? Pick up your cross and follow me. Are you Darkness, or are you light in the Lord? Let's close our eyes. Let's close our eyes, please. Let's have a moment here of privacy. I'm very aware it's a strong word. And I hope you've heard my heart as I have endeavored to communicate in the tone of the letter. I actually think the way Paul communicated, indeed Jesus himself, was much stronger than many would think. I hope for those who are not right with God, I hope that you have heard hope this morning. 
You too have heard the problem and the solution, the opportunity, the invitation by the Spirit of God to surrender, to die, to yield. Just be honest and say, God, I'm not walking right. Maybe you've never walked right. Friend, I beg you, if you sincerely and with all your heart turn from sin, turn from trusting yourself with all your heart, sincerely acknowledge His Lordship and acknowledge the Christ of the cross, acknowledging the Christ of the resurrection and putting your faith and trust in Him. If you want to turn 180 degrees and pursue Him and surrender and ask for His forgiveness, if you do that, He will transform you. His grace will fill your heart. His love will surround you. And you can experience a new nature.